Okay. Well, Phil Spoggy is with us um, to talk about the 19th Indiana and its color guard at the Battle of Gettysburg. And Phil, uh, if you saw his bio on our website, uh, has been a longtime member of the uh, 19th Regiment Indiana Volunteer Infantry, the North South Skirmish Association for like 41 years and served in several uh, officer positions in that organization, including um, on the board of directors, uh, commander of the Midwest region, uh, national inspector general, national deputy commander, paymaster, and national commander of the organization. He's live fired about every type of firearm that uh, was used in the American Civil War. Uh, done a lot of work with people that uh, we've probably heard of, uh, Ron, Eddington, Lance Hurtigan, Eric Wittenberg, who spoke at our group, Dave Powell, Dan Masters, Scott Mingus, Don Traiani, and others, and he's assisted in their research. Um, he was recently at um, Gettysburg just a few weeks ago, because I saw pictures he posted on his Facebook page, along with some comments with Carol Reardon, uh, author of a book on Pickett's Charge. And uh, in talking to him Monday night during our practice session, I found out that he has actually deadlifted more than I have. So, uh, you know, there's some resentment there on my part, uh, but we are glad to have him. I'm really glad to have him to talk about uh, one of the regiments that helped play an important part in the Battle of Gettysburg that wasn't named the 20th Maine. So with that terrible introduction. <laughs> That's a great introduction. <laughs> I'm gonna turn it over to Phil. Thanks for well, being well, first, I'm, I hope you guys are enjoying the same weather we've got down here in near Dayton because it's snowing. We probably got three inches in the last three or four hours. So I'm sure in Cleveland, you've got more than we have here, which means it would have been interesting traveling up there to do this live. I much prefer to do these presentations, you know, live. Zoom is, well, it's what we have. So we'll try to make the best of it. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be talking about the 19th Indiana and the color guard. I heard someone mention a little bit ago uh, about uh, the, the painting, the black hats, uh, tronies uh, that he did about six years ago. Part of the presentation is gonna cover um, how that painting came to life, came from a concept to life. And a, it was a pretty interesting experience working with Don, but we'll get that later. Uh, let me know if you're seeing everything I'm seeing right now. Uh, the title of our program is going to be Boys, We Must Hold Our Colors on This Line or Lie Here Under Them, which is what Colonel Sam Williams uh, told the boys of the 19th Indiana as they were huddled on the eastern bank of uh, Willoughby's Run on the afternoon of um, July 1st, 1863. Uh, give you a little background what we're going to talk about more than anything else <clears throat> is going to be the 19th Indiana at Gettysburg sure and we're going to lead up uh, to the battle basically starting on June 30th however we're going to try to concentrate a little bit on the action of the color guard and uh, the casualties they took I'll put a caveat into this a little bit I won't do a great big deep dive into it because uh, my friend John Michael Priest, and I'm sure you guys have, have his some of his books, is working on a Gettysburg book now. And part of it is we're really deep diving into uh, who carried the colors and when they fell. And uh, so I don't want to steal some of the thunder that we've been working on right now, at least till his book comes out. But we'll, we'll touch on some things. As you know about the 19th Indiana, it was in the Iron Brigade. And originally, it was brigaded with uh, the 2nd, 6th, and 7th Wisconsin. Uh, in October of 1862, the 24th Michigan joined the brigade uh, to help, A, to keep it as a Western brigade, and B, to make up for the losses the brigade had suffered from uh, August 28, 1862, until September 17, 1862, which is uh, basically, uh, the, the fight at, um, 
Gainesville or Groveton. You know, back to the uh, the nineteenth Indiana. Uh, Brigaded with the 2nd, 6th, 7th Wisconsin, and eventually October 62, the 24th Michigan. Uh, perhaps um, maybe the least known of the Iron Brigade regiments. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know exactly why that might be. Um, there's no regimental history written of the 19th. They didn't have um, a Rufus Dawes, for example. Uh, a William uh, Harry's, for example, to write a lot after the war. Um, maybe it was because what they went through was actually too horrible to even put down in paper. But because of that, it's kind of hard to research. Lance Hurtigan, my friend, has done a lot of good work on the Iron Brigade and obviously Wisconsin regiments being from Wisconsin. But at the same time, we've talked about the 19th, and he said they're just, it, it's a hard, it's a hard regiment sort of research. So uh, they were known as the Sw Swamp Hogs, number 19. They were the least disciplined of the Iron Brigade regiments uh, in uniform and in uh, uh, appearance. Uh, uh, a lot of times, John Gibbon had a lot of problems with them. Um, when he issued him the frock coat and the hardy hat, and in particular the white gaiters, um, they protested so much against the gaiters that they actually put them on his on Gibbons' horse at one time. And uh, the gaiters actually were only issued one time, and that was in 1862. So, if you ever see any any images or paintings or anything of Iron Brigade soldiers that have gaiters on, you know that it should be in 1862. Uh, the 19th Indiana was also known as Old Posey County. Uh, it, one of the quotes is, every man of them did not care at all darn how he was dressed, but he was all hell for a fight. And they were a, a really hard fighting Western regiment as were the other regiments in the Iron Brigade. One of the things that they would do, the 6th Wisconsin was probably the best drilled and continually the best uniformed, um, the Calico 6th of the Iron Brigade regiments. One of the things the 19th guys would do is they would take the one off their hardy hat, take the nine, turn it upside down, and that when they would forage for chickens in particular, then the 6th Wisconsin would get blamed for being the regiment, the black hatted regiment that uh, that captured the, the rebel chickens. So as we move ahead, this is a picture of the current 19th Indiana uh, color guard. You know, what exactly is a color guard? Well, a color guard is one or two uh, color bearers, one carrying the United States flag and the, our national color. The other one usually was called the state flag that was also known as the banner. You'll see a lot of that in the writings, how they would uh, tell the difference. And then after that, you would have six or eight color guards. And these would be corporals. They would be handpicked for the most part. And their job was to protect the colors and to pick up the colors if they should fall. Uh, the color guards themselves, the flag bearers, were unarmed. And they, did not, they didn't have the accoutrements on. They just carried the flag. That was their, that was their sole duty. And the protectors were the color guards. Uh, John Gibbon, who actually was the, actually, he didn't form the Iron Brigade. He wasn't the first commander Rufus King was, but he probably had the biggest stamp on the brigade uh, when it came to drill and discipline from May of 1862 until that fall when he rose to division command. Um, Gibbon uh, had, in, in particular, a, um, he wrote what a color guard was. And you could imagine he expressed this sentiment to the color guards of the Iron Brigade regiments. He said, the officers and men of the command should understand that their colors should be the last thing surrendered and that in all well-regulated all, uh, well military organizations is considered disgraceful for a majority of the command to return from the field of battle without them. Um, this is John Gibbon right here. 
uh, the Boss Soldier, um, known my favorite uh, nickname for any Civil War general for Gibbon is Johnny the Warhorse. That's what his men called him. Uh, probably a, one of the great American soldiers to come out of the American Civil War, his service during the war, wounded three times, and then his service after the war on the Western frontier where he was wounded again. Uh, one of the best quotes that you'll ever read about Gibbon was Theodore Lyman wrote, by the roadside was Gibbon and a tower of strength he is, cool as a steel knife, always, a, always and unmoved by anything and everything. And you know that demeanor was expressed to his men. Now, originally they did not like him one bit. Uh, discipline, uh, the Gators, as, as I mentioned, um, you know, uh, especially the 19th, because the 19th Colonel being Solomon Meredith, who was basically a political Colonel. And we'll talk about him in a little bit. Gibbon didn't like him. And, and I think the feeling was mutual, but after they went through the horrific fighting, especially at Gainesville, the men of the Iron Brigade found out just what kind of soldier was their uh, general, their Brigadier General. Uh, he, uh, as he viewed the, the wounded and the dead after the fight at Great, uh, Gainesville on August 28, 1862, he was moved to tears. And that was seen by his men and very shortly they would be engaged in South Mountain and then of course in the cornfield of Antietam and by the end of that service they had a real affection for the type of soldier that Gibbon was. Um, I should mention the Battery B 4th U.S. Artillery uh, which was Gibbon's pre-war command was attached to the Iron Brigade it became known as the Iron Brigade Battery. And at the Battle of Antietam, Gibbon actually got off his horse and he had noticed that the muzzle of one of the 12 pounder Napoleons had risen above the level of its effectiveness and he, he turned the muzzle down. And that's when they started blasting the cornfield with canister. So uh, you put all those things together from May of 1862 when he was basically not appreciated at all and by September of 1862 he was he was very fondly thought of and uh, the feeling was mutual there's a letter uh, to his wife that he um, wrote about writing his farewell speech to the unit which would have been in October 62 when he was promoted to division command and it was it, it, he was quite moved by um, the men and the experience, and he really didn't want to leave his old command, but he did. Uh, Gibbon was born in Philadelphia, moved to North Carolina, his family did as a youth, and he had um, three of his brothers fought for the Confederacy. One of them was a actually at Gettysburg. He was a surgeon in one of the North Carolina units at Gettysburg. Uh, the family, there was no reconciliation to speak of. Uh, after the war with the Gibbon family. Uh, he was not spoken of by his, by his family after the war. Abner Doubleday, and I included Abner in here because, you know, when you talk about July 1st, 1863, and you talk about the fight at Gettysburg, um, we all know, you know, that, you know, Abner, you know, I mean, um, you know, he, I guess you could say that, um, he threw out the first pitch for the federal side at Fort Sumter. He liked to be called the hero of Fort Sumter. I can't because he fired the first cannon. I don't, I don't understand how you can be called yourself a hero when you end up surrendering the fort, but a solid soldier but not exactly an inspirational soldier. Um, his soldiers referred to him as old 48 hours because he was slow and methodical. And if you look at what he did, he had the best day 
of his career, July 1st of 1863, without a doubt. Coming in, if you want to use a baseball analogy, because we know he didn't invent baseball, but a lot of people still think he did. Uh, coming in out of the bullpen for John Reynolds when he was killed, uh, basically controlling the battle of the first corps. Uh, he took command. He basically took command of everything south of Chambersburg Road and James Wadsworth had command on the north side of the road. Uh, but Abner had a solid, solid day. Um, he was for his reward for a solid day was the night of July 1st, or I should say early in the morning, July 2nd, George Gordon Meade, who did not like him one bit and never did like him one bit, relieved him of his core command, but John Newton, uh, who had been a divisional commander in the sixth corps, I believe into that command. And Abner went back to divisional command and never after Gettysburg, he never held another field command again and spent the rest of his life uh, basically trying to clear what he turned was a slight. And, you know, it, it actually was. I mean, I think Abner Doubleday uh, is one of the solid heroes of the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg. And I think a lot of people... Um, a lot of people don't don't give him the credit that is due for holding the first corps to task in what I think was really the most pivotal day of the three day battle. I really do, and that that's a subject for a whole nother roundtable discussion that we can have on that. But that's Abner Doubleday, and he was in command of the first corps after John Reynolds fell. Solomon Meredith. Long saw Meredith, six feet, seven inches. Abe Lincoln called him his, his Quaker general. Saul was a Quaker. As a young man, he walked from uh, basically uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, where his family was from. And he walked all the way to Indiana to, to, as a teenager to start, to start his new life. So uh, Saul was... Uh, had been a farmer in the Cambridge City. He was a politician. He was a, a sheriff and a, a clerk of courts. And he was a particular favorite of uh, Governor Nelson of Indiana. So because of that, he became in 1861, the Colonel of the 19th Indiana. Now, he was not a favorite of, by any means, of John Gibbon. They couldn't have been any different. And what happened was this. Number one, they never liked each other. Let's start from the beginning. But we got to September of 1862. And at the Battle of South Mountain, Saul was wounded, a fall from his horse. So he went to Washington City. And in Washington City, he started to do what political generals did. He wanted to be a brigadier general. And he was also a very, very close to Joe Hooker, who Hooker needed the political connections to further his career that Meredith had through Bull Nelson, or not Bull Nelson, but through Governor uh, Morton, excuse me. So Saul is in Washington the Battle of Antietam happens. The Lieutenant Colonel Lois Bachman is in command of the 19th, and he is killed on the field. And Gibbon, absolutely, there. I mean, you would never, you can never make this up to John Gibbon. You can never, the fact that you were, okay, you might have been wounded a little bit, but you left your command to uh, politic, to become a Brigadier General, and then, you know, the Lieutenant Colonel leads the command and he gets killed. Um, Gibbon never got over this. And this is what he wrote 20 years later in his biography, which is a great read if you get a chance to read it. Um, after the Battle of Antietam, one of my colonels, and you notice he'll never, he'll, he never mentions Meredith by name, who had not been with his regiment there, went to Washington where he succeeded, as I suppose by pure political influence in getting himself appointed a Brigadier General of Volunteers, a position he was in no way fitted to fill. I felt outraged at the way of, 
of this way of making military promotions, especially when I was told this appointment was made for distinguished services in the Battle of Antietam, where the Lieutenant Colonel of the regiment, Lois Bachman, was killed commanding the regiment. I had at least two colonels in the brigade, which richly won promotion. I afterwards learned, however, that the appointment referred to had been made on special recommendation of General Hooker. Uh, Lysander Cutler would have been the, was the preferred uh, uh, colonel that uh, Gibbon would have preferred. Now, that said, that all said about Saul. Saul's one of my favorites. Uh, I think he, a little bit like Dan Sickles, may get short shift in history because of Gibbon's dislike. But at the same time, he led the brigade after Antietam you know, through Fredericksburg, which they weren't heavily engaged, and on in uh, to uh, the Chancellorsville campaign, and then at Gettysburg, where he was wounded again uh, during that during the battle. Now, I, I just want you to think about this about Saul. Saul had two of his sons that died of effects of wounds. Two of his three sons died of effects of wounds during the American Civil War. Uh, Samuel was a lieutenant on his staff. He was wounded at Gettysburg also. He died in January of 1864 at home in Cambridge City, Indiana. His other son, David, was a major uh, with uh, the night with uh, the seventh or the 15th U.S. Infantry. He was severely wounded in the leg at Chickamauga, was breveted stayed in the stayed in the in the army after the war fought a battle with alcoholism and depression and actually ended up dying at home again in Cambridge City in uh, April of 1867. I, I think that the Meredith family uh, sacrificed enough during the American Civil War and I think Saul's service why not you can't say it was stellar but at the same time, I think it, it, it was solid. It was solid. And as men, you, you won't find you won't find hardly a bad word from the men of the 19th about Colonel Meredith. Sam Williams was the Colonel of the 19th at Gettysburg. He was a 32-year-old merchant and a farmer from Selma, Indiana, a solid field officer, well liked by his men. Uh, one of the quotes that uh, we have is he was in the thickest of the fight at Gettysburg from the commencement and could be seen frequently in advance of his regiment making observations for the success and safety of his friend. He very narrowly escaped twice, a ball passing through his hat, and another one was struck his side, penetrating his coat, and nearly threw a map that was lodged in, the, in his coat pocket. The colonel was, has, has never taken the ball out of the map, but keeps it always. Colonel Williams was killed at the Battle of Ant, uh, at Wilderness in 1864. He left behind a widow and six children. This is Colonel Lieutenant Colonel Dudley of the 19th Indiana. Dudley, native of Vermont, uh, he won promotion from captain of Company B for his gallantry during the Battle of Antietam. Uh, he would be shot in the leg at Gettysburg. Uh, it is said by some of the early guidebooks you'll read that the monument of the 19th marks the location where Dudley was wounded. The, the wound would shatter his, low, his leg into 15 fragments, led to amputation after the battle at the uh, Hospital at a uh, brigade hospital in Littlestown, Pennsylvania, I believe. Uh, it, uh, he died in 1909 and is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. Um, he was another one of the field officers at the Battle of Gettysburg along with Sam Williams. Now we'll get into the color guard a little bit. This gentleman here is Burlington Cunningham, and he carried the national colors at Gettysburg. This image was taken in the winter of 1861, hence the 4-H cap instead of the black hat that the Iron Brigade in 19th Indiana was known for. And the flag he holds appears to be like a flank marker, a smaller flank marker or guide on of some sort. 
Burlington was wounded at Gettysburg, and this image was taken at a hospital in Philadelphia in the fall of 1863 while he recovered. It's interesting note because a lot of people will say, and the, the Burlington's on the left, he's a sergeant, and the gentleman on the right is his friend William, William Bingham of a Pennsylvania Cavalry Regiment. But a lot, a lot of people will say, well, he didn't, he's, you know, he doesn't have a frock coat on. He doesn't have a frock coat on. One of the things that uh, a soldiers did is at, at times, especially if they were at home, whether it's on furlough or, you know, on whether like, well, in the hospitals, a lot of times they might have a custom coat made or jacket. And in this case, this almost looks like he took a frock coat and cut it down to make a shell jacket. Uh, it's pretty, uh, you know, pretty fashionable looking if you ask me. But you'll show people people this image, and they'll say, "Well, he do, he doesn't have the frock coat on." This this gentleman, this is Abram Buck. Abe was, well, Abe was either 15, 16, 17 at the time of the battle. It depends on what account you read. And Abe was something else. His driving ambition at, was to be the color guard, the color bearer of the 19th Indiana. He was a member of the color guard. Um, he would be wounded at Getty, he would be wounded at Second Manassas, at Get Gettysburg, in the wilderness, and in the closing days of the war as lieutenant in the 20th Indiana, he lost his right leg. Um, he won, he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for his uh, heroism carrying the colors at the Battle of the Wilderness. And after the war, he became a judge in California, a Superior Court judge. He died there in 1915, and that is where he is buried. Okay, those are some of the players that we'll talk about. Now, I just want to give you a feel for the men of the 19th. Now we're going to start with taking a look at the night of June 30th. The, on June 30th, the Iron Brigade and the 1st Division, the 1st Corps, was pushed up to Marsh Creek. And a lot of people think, and you'll read a lot of things about, you know, the Iron Brigade, you know, March, uh, camped on the bank of March Creek. Well, they did, except the 19th Indiana was pushed out on picket duty in advance of March Creek, a couple miles, and they were put actually on, their picket line was actually on Warfield Ridge, which I'm sure you're all familiar with from the second day's battle at Gettysburg. Um, it was written, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dudley wrote, and we were picketing in the shadow of the big mountain of Great Round Top. William Roby Moore, which we'll hear more about, wrote, uh, we were a bit disgruntled and envious that our black hatted comrades got to stop, build their coffee fires and relax while they had to move beyond the Iron Brigade bivouac position, while we had to move beyond the bivouac position the men soon found comfort in the food prepared for them by the Pennsylvania farm women. And I, you know, those women came from farms such as names such as Bushman and Slider and Sherfy and, and Klingle. So they were pushed out far in advance and they were the advance of the uh, First Corps uh, picket line. So next time you're at Gettysburg and you drive down Warfield Ridge, and you've got the Alabama monument there and you got the Texas, you know, monument there. Think about the night before. That's where the ninth, the boys from the 19th spent, spent their or last night. A lot of them spent their last night on June 30th. And actually, to be clear, there were only five companies were out on picket duty. I believe the other five were back near Greenmont, which Greenmont, that area right there when you see kind of look south of the blue line and you see a little cloud off to the left. That's the Eisenhower and Vent Center. And that's basically where the brigade, the rest of the 19th was that night. July 1st, 1863, the Iron Brigade starts to advance and they fell on the, they fell into a line. There's a map for you. Uh, where they advanced into, but they fell on the line uh, from Marsh Creek. The 19th Indiana fell in as the rest of the brigade came up the Emmitsburg Road. They still had no idea that they would be in a fight that day. Um, as they moved further uh, north up the Emmitsburg Road, 
passing places such as the Bushman Farm and the Shurfee Farm and the soon to be famous Peach Orchard. Uh, uh, Rufus Dove ordered the Fife and Drum Corps of um, our Fife and Drum Band, it was a core of the Six Wisconsin to play, start playing the Campbells are coming. Uh, they were just as because they knew they'd be in the town and they wanted to inspire the uh, town folk. Pretty soon they started hearing the sound of the guns. There was a bustle in the front of the Iron Brigade. Actually, uh, Cutler's Brigade had led the march, so they were in front of the Iron Brigade. And it became evident that there was a battle uh, going on north and west of town. Uh, they got to the area of the Kadori Farm. And at the Kadori Farm, they went cross lots uh, across what would later be in, in a couple of days, the fields of Pickett Charge and on Seminary Ridge. Then they moved north on Seminary Ridge to the area of the um, Lutheran Seminary. Now this is a view right here from East McPherson's Ridge looking to the east to the Lutheran Seminary building. Uh, the Iron Brigade would have formed in this area in front of the Lutheran Seminary building. Um, you, you read some accounts that, 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 that they formed um, in back of the building. Uh, there's some confusion during those accounts of what was the front and what was the back, but the front of the building is actually on the east side where you would go through uh, the entrance to the Seminary Ridge Museum right now. So they were formed the attack started uh, really rapidly with John Reynolds leading the second Wisconsin, followed in echelon by the seventh Wisconsin, and then the 24th or the 19th Indiana, then the 24th uh, Michigan. Uh, you know, Reynolds got to the eastern side of McPherson's Woods and, you know, drive those fellows from the woods. Uh, then he was immediately uh, shot and killed and uh, command would uh, fall to uh, Doubleday, who was yet to get to the field. And it, it's kind of hard to, to um, Abner wrote a couple different accounts of the first day and sometimes he put himself places that maybe he wasn't there yet. But at this, I don't think Abner got to the field much before maybe they say Reynolds was shot at 10, maybe 10, 30 or 11. But this gives a back to the map gives you an idea of the advance of the um, of the Iron Brigade under Meredith. And again, that's looking east um, in the swale uh, down here, which is kind of on this side of the building. There's a swale, and that's where the the event happened. The 19th was advancing. A staff officer rides down the line. They they Burlington Cunningham paused and asked Abe to pull the shuck, the shuck being the cover over the colors because they're cased on the march. They, they're not flying to pull the shuck. The staff officer said, "Don't we don't have time. Don't stop. Don't pull the shuck. And Abe and, and Burlington said, Abe, pull the shuck. So that's when they let the colors fly as they advanced up the eastern face of McPherson's Ridge. Now, this is another view as if you're advancing and you've just crested the crest at East McPherson's Ridge. And on the, down along the tree line is, um, would be uh, Willoughby's Run. Uh, off to the right is gonna be the, uh, what would be the Herps Woodlot, other, you know, McPherson's Woods, later, you know, Reynolds Woods, off to this area here. 19th and the 24th, far outflanked Archer's Brigade that morning. Uh, and as they advanced, they wrapped their flank, their, their regiments wrapped around the right flank of Archer's Brigade, actually moving in this area and moving to the Northwest, cross will be run and rolled up that flank. It was a pretty, it was a pretty quick action. Now, as that happens, as they make, as they crest right here, a couple things happened to the color guard we can get into. Burlington Cunningham is carrying the colors. As soon as they come over the crest, he's wounded. He's shot in the side. And a lot of people thought he was dead. So this was Abe Buckle's big chance. Abe grabbed the national colors. And this advance was really quick. 
up, up across this field and across Will Bay, and they rolled up the Confederates. And Abe led the 19th. He got all the way up the, the eastern face, the Hare Ridge, by himself with the colors, with Dudley chasing him, saying, come back, you damn fool. Come back. You're outpacing everybody. They said they, may, they thought Abe may have been trying to carry the colors to Richmond. But so he got back uh, on the eastern uh, side of um, Willoughby Run. This is a picture of Willoughby Run looking uh, basically if you walk down from the 19th Monument, looking to the north, this uh, was actually on the right bank is where the 19th would form. Uh, they reformed. They didn't take many casualties uh, in that morning advance. It was really quick. They rolled up Archer's Brigade. Uh, captured a whole bunch of Confederates. The numbers are kind of all over the charts. Um, Dudley wrote after the war that uh, he detailed Sergeant Major Blanchard to um, destroy 400 Confederate muskets on the rocks of Willoughby Run. So that's what that's what Blanchard and Detail did. Uh, then they ate their lunch and had some coffee. There was sporadic artillery fire from, I would say that, uh, action was over by 11.30 until early afternoon. Uh, the other interesting thing that happened at this time, the 24th Michigan was the left flank regiment of the Iron Brigade on the advance of the morning on July 1st. Now, when they came back to this position on the eastern bank of Willoughby's Run and through the uh, western edge of uh, the Herbst Woodlot, the 19th was switched with the 24th and put on the left flank. Um, there, there's really, no one really wrote why this happened. I think it was because Solomon Meredith knew that the brigade's flank was gonna be in the air and he wanted an experienced regiment on that flank. And remember the 24th, had only been under fire uh, some at Fredericksburg and at Chancellorsville. You know, they were still a big regiment. They had 496 men in the rank, ranks compared to the 288 of the 19th. So I think that, um, that Saul, or perhaps it was Abner Doubleday, because there's some, uh, there's some mystery to when Saul was wounded on the, on the, the day of the, of the first, switched the regiments around and uh, made sure that he had an experienced regiment on his very vulnerable uh, left flank. Um, the afternoon was spent, you know, a couple hours. They really, it was a law in the battle, except like I said, for the artillery fire. July 1st, 1863, about three o'clock in the afternoon, the ball really opened for, for the brigade. And this is when the Confederates started their advance. Heath had been, you know, they'd been pushed back, punched in the nose pretty good the morning. They recovered, you know, they came back and this is the afternoon advance in particular of Pettigrew's brigade against the 19th. Brockenbrough wasn't much of a factor as you see on this fine map by my friend, John Heiser, but we talked about, before we get into this, I wanna talk about this exposed left flank of the 19th Indiana, because it's very important. If, if you look at a map, you go, why was it exposed? You know, I mean, how come, what, you know, cause I mean, how come the 142nd Pennsylvania or Biddle wasn't tied in? Well, it's, you know, it's the old story, the terrain drives the battle. And they moved the 142nds and Biddle, they moved into that open field in the, in the late morning when they came up. And the Confederate artillery fire was so bad and the sharpshooter fire that they were taking from the Harmon farm was so bad that they had to move back under the uh, lip of McPherson's Ridge. So that left a big, that left the 19th in there. And that you can see where the 142nd Pennsylvania is here. It was even for them to segue a little bit, it was so bad. Once they moved into that swale that we saw a picture of, they started to take artillery fire from the Confederate artillery on Oak Hill. So they actually at one time were 
in the sunken embankment of what uh, the Moomawsburg, not the Moomawsburg Road, but the Fairfield Road and or the Hagerstown Road. And then they would be moved out in this field. So if you if you ever want to read, get, just read the OR reports and some of the reports of Biddle's Brigade and how much they moved around, but they could never tie in uh, effectively to the 19th flank. And that would become a big problem in the afternoon with the Confederate advance. Um, it's important a little bit now as we look at this next slide, and I apologize for the arrows because I was having the trouble getting them, my map right, but this gives you an idea of where the 19th was and the 24th Michigan was just out by them. And they faced, you know, you, if you look at the numbers and, and the numbers are important, um, the, the 19th and the, the um, 24th Michigan uh, together in the morning at the morning muster had about mustering about 764 men, okay? The 26th North Carolina and the 11th North Carolina together had 1,456 men. The 26th North Carolina as a regiment had 839 men. So if you talk about frontage and regimental frontage, the 19th and the 24th together, their regimental front was probably no more than 250 yards. So you can see how quickly they were outflanked by the, in particular, the 11th uh, North Carolina. Uh, the 19th was also engaged heavily with the right flank of the 26th North Carolina. You know, before this attack or as this attack was forming, Sam uh, Williams sent Asa Blanchard, the Sergeant Major, back to, uh, he said, Meredith, to ask if they could move back to uh, McPherson, East McPherson's Ridge. And the answer, Meredith sent him to Doubleday, and Doubleday said, no, that's your position. We're going to hold it. You must hold it. If you can't hold and that's the famous thing that uh, Asa Blanchard supposedly told Doubleday that if, well, if we can't hold it, where will you find men that will? So that is, even though Sam Williams had asked to be pulled back uh, to the ridge, uh, East McPherson's Ridge, um, it, it didn't happen. The attack happened, they were flanked. Um, it was pretty quick within I would say 15 or 20 minutes, the 19th Indiana suffered at least 100 casualties out of what they had there. Um, comp uh, company B and, uh, and parts of D and E were actually on the Western side of McPherson's Ridge on the skirmish line. They came tumbling back pretty quick. Um, Lieutenant Sam Slagle who was in command of the skirmishers was wounded. He laid out in that field on the western side of McPherson's uh, or uh, Willoughby Run for a couple of days before they got. He survived the. He actually survived the battle, but he uh, he was uh, he died shortly after the battle or shortly after the war. Eleventh um, uh, North Carolina uh, quickly crossed the run and quickly flanked the nineteenth and the 19th started to fall back. And the second position is where the second blue line is. And it's, it's a couple hundred yards back or so. Uh, there's a slight ravine. I don't know how many of you have been in McPherson's woods. I walked through it a couple weeks ago again. Interesting terrain. It's not very big. There's a slight ravine that runs through it from uh, the northeast to the southwest. And I feel that is uh, was a fallback position for the 19th and the 24th Michigan. It's kind of hard to tell. I mean, this thing was this thing was uh, so fluid and so quick. Uh, actually, it was probably over uh, shorter than the time I'm trying to explain it. Uh, Captain Holland Richardson wrote that he said that the men were falling like dew before the morning sun. They melted away. So 19th gave way very stubbornly and they bent back and they got in the woods and they used the trees for cover. There's one account that they said they had, there was one tree that had so many guys behind it, it was like a, like a, a dog's tail uh, behind it. So uh, they ended up coming back 
first uh, where the first blue, the second blue line is, and then uh, their final position on East McPherson's Ridge would be where the, the blue line on the right is. This is looking south. This is kind of a terrain picture for you. This is looking south where the 11th North Carolina would have crossed Willoughby's Run, just kind of give you an idea. Again, it's down in the run uh, just west of the 19th Monument. And this is a picture of uh, in the 1880s of the 19th Monument. One of the problems with interpreting the battle today on that is the terrain has changed. Um, uh, Springs Avenue had run through there on the way over to the resort on the other side of the uh, uh, Willoughby's Run. Uh, the, the trolley had moved through there. They moved the land around. But this kind of gives you an idea of the terrain feature. That lake obviously wasn't there during the time of the battle. 19th Monument, I just wanted to show not so much the monument, but the rise in terrain behind the monument. And that is what Sam Williams was looking at. And that is where the 142nd Pennsylvania and Biddle's Brigade were when the flank attack came. And what's, what's, what's unique about that is this rise actually protected the right flank of the 11th North Carolina from fire from the 142nd Pennsylvania. Of course, they were busy at that time too, as they were under attack. And that's just a picture, again, to show you the, from the monument, looking uh, actually south uh, uh, east, and that little guy, that's, uh, that's our hero, Abner Doubleday statue there. So you can kind of see how the terrain actually played a real factor on that flanking movement along with numbers. One of these days, I'll learn how to use a PowerPoint presentation. Again, I'd much rather do this. Now, this view is from the arrow is right where the 19th monument is on the other side of the road. And it's not formatted, so it's, it hide, actually hides a monument. But this is sort of how in this area, which is less than 300 yards to where the 19th final position and Iron Brigade's final position was on East McPherson's Ridge is, um, Within this area, probably eight to 10 of the color guards were either wounded or killed. And the 19th flank would have fallen back. Actually, if you were looking at the 19th right now, you'd be looking down the line from its left flank. The left flank would be kind of along the road and the 11th North Carolina would be coming from your left. They're taking fire from your left. So what happens down starting at the monument Burlington Cunningham who was wounded on in the morning is back during the law he appears back and he takes the colors away from from Abe uh, Abe ends up with the regimental banner in the area of the monument when the attack happened from the 26th North Carolina and 11th North Carolina uh, they quickly both were wounded uh, he uh, buckles and Cunningham goes down. Abe takes a ball to the shoulder. Colonel Dudley grabs the colors at this point. Asa Blanchard, the sergeant major, he goes to the colonel and says, Colonel, you shouldn't have done that. It was my duty. I'll never forgive myself. Dudley had been shot right away in the shin. That's when he would lose his leg. Uh, at that point, a color corporal, Dable Phipps, had both that flags. Asa was put in charge of finding people to get the flags. Phipps was holding them. You know, he, go, he gets wounded. Uh, and then uh, Lieutenant William Macy yells to an enlisted man, uh, the flag is down, go get it. And the enlisted man says, go to hell, I won't do it because the color car is getting shot up along with everybody else. Now, William Roby Moore wrote a great, a diary, not actually not a diary, but uh, his uh, reminiscences of the War of the 19th. Interesting guy. And um, Moore would write, uh, he said, uh, finally our flag fell and Lieutenant Macy told me to go get it. I didn't want to, but did. 
in my mind, Moore's the guy who said, you know, go to hell, I'm not going to do it. But he eventually did. As soon as I done so, I got the impression that I would be a goner. And a minute later, a mini ball took the bone out of my index finger on my left hand. Unfortunately for me, the ball had not come straight from the front or it would have come through the flagstaff of my body. And they came from the 11th, North Carolina, which were on, which was off to the left, obviously. Um, they, the 11th, North Carolina, were turning our left flank, which accounted for the direction from which the mini that hit my finger came from. He said, anyway, that waked me. And when I looked back, I discovered the greater part of the regiment was back up the hill, firing over our heads. And if you look at the terrain, you can see that in my mind, that's where Moore and you'll find out in a minute, Asa Blanchard were, were down in this area because the regiment would have been about where we've been standing. And you could see you could fire over their heads from that position because of the, because of the, the rise in the train. Uh, our Sergeant Major Asa had the regimental banner and was then standing some 30 paces off to my right. I called to him and said, we better get up the hill to the regiment. He was sort of a pompous kind of fellow and seemed to pay no attention to my warning. So I swung the flag over my shoulder and winded my way up the hill. At that point, he was ordered by Colonel Williams to give the flag to another soldier because of his wound. William said, you're bleeding from the hand, go to, go to the, you, know, you lost your finger, go to the rear. Morse said, I didn't want to go. He tried to give the flag to old Joe Carter. He was a Virginian in, in the ranks of the 19th Indiana. And Joe said, nope, don't want it. He said, uh, I'm, he was laying down behind the fence shooting. He said, I can do, I can do better work that down here shooting than I can carrying the colors. So uh, he wanted to do more shooting. So eventually a big, a big sergeant in Company I, who we think was Israel Blair, took the colors. Uh, he would be captured late, late, later. Blair goes down. Colonel Williams orders the flag shut because they're drawing so much fire. And can you imagine this, how fluid this is? I mean, you know, I mean, this is just all happening at the same time. So they tried to shut the flags. Uh, Lieutenant Macy and Lieutenant Crockett the, and, and Co Color Corporal Burr Clifford shucked the colors. While doing so, Crockett is shot and killed. Now, Crockett was a lieutenant, but he did not know of his promotion, and they could only identify his body when the 19th got, soldiers got out there on July 5th by his sergeant's chevrons on the body, on the, on the coat. So he went down, and he was killed. Um, Colonel Williams, uh, I should say, excuse me, let me get my, uh, Sergeant Major uh, Blanchard confronts uh, Lieutenant Macy. He wants to know why the flags have been shucked. He explains to him that the Colonel said shuck them. Blanchard appeals to the Colonel who told Macy to give Asa the national color. Asa unfurled it, started waving the flag, was yelling, rally boys rally when he was hit in the leg and basically bled out as he fell to the ground he said tell mother i never faltered now that that's a lot of information for someone to remember what his exact words were but i tell you that quote actually the first time i uh, earliest i've seen it was in a book uh, called the boys of 61 by charles coffin that was published in 1866 so Blanchard goes down, Burr Clifford grabbed the flag, he heads over off East McPherson Ridge to, to the barricade, to the Seminary Ridge uh, Museum, or where the Seminary Ridge Museum is, and the slight barricade of rails, which was the rally point for, the, uh, for, for a large part of the First Corps. And then eventually he would take the colors onto um, East Cemetery Hill. So, a lot of the color guards down, Sergeant Major is dead. And this is a, some detail off the Elliott burial map, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. But, and even though it's a given that the Elliott map in some areas is very inaccurate, what we do, what I want you to look at is the number of graves in the area where uh, Meredith Avenue is uh, along the south 
and then along the area where the flag says where Reynolds fell, where, where Reynolds fell. Consider that the next time you're driving on Meredith Avenue or you're driving on, on Reynolds Avenue, uh, that gives you an idea of um, just how severe the combat was in that in Herbst Woodlot. Scott Hartwig writes, wrote a, a, a very great article and it's on uh, the National Park Service website of Gettysburg and some of their files on the fight in the Herbst Woodlot. I mean, it's one of the best articles I've ever read. If you get a chance, go online, uh, get it or shoot me an email afterwards. And I'll send you a link. And I mean, it, it, it really is good. Um, if you look at the 35 acres or so of the Herbst Woodlot and the surrounding fields, think about this. Figure 2,200 casualties on, the, on July 1st there, which actually makes it some of the bloodiest ground in American history. One who fell was Peter, Peter Faust. Company C of the 19th, 39-year-old farmer from Randolph County, left behind a wife, Sarah, and three children, Elizabeth, age four, William, two and a half, and his namesake, Peter, age one, who would never know his father. Peter Faust is buried in the National Cemetery at Gettysburg. There's a picture of him. And the, a great representation of the Iron Brigade uniform, probably taken in Fredericksburg in 1862, They've got the 61 Springfields they were armed with, correct accoutrements, and no gators. So we've talked a little bit about the color guard and the fight as much as we can. But now the, the, there's, there's a story here of, of Asa Blanchard flag. And it dovetails into the Troni print quite, quite nicely. 1880s. Uh, William Dudley wrote a letter to Blanchard's family about basically the gallantry of his of, of their sergeant of the sergeant major and the flag that he so barely born the bloodstained flag that the family had in their possession that was wrapped his body off the Battle of Gettysburg. And then in 1913 uh, for the 50th anniversary of the battle, you start seeing a lot of articles and there's an article in the Carroll County newspaper, a relic of the battlefield of Gettysburg. And this was supposed to be the regimental flag of the 19th Indiana. And there it is today in the museum uh, in uh, Indianapolis. And you know, that's, you know, this was the blood soaked flag of the 19th Indiana. And the holes are supposed to be bullet holes that uh, a, a guy in 1913 supposedly cleaned the flag and then he made the holes all nice and you know, they put backing so you could tell where the bullet holes were. Uh, this is not the regimental color that was carried by the 19th at Gettysburg. Uh, what is it? Okay, well first, one of the stories about Blanchard was he was carried back to his home in Richmond, Indiana and buried after the battle. Well, that's not true either. He was buried on July 12th, 1863 in Congressional Cemetery, Washington, D.C., where he lies today because his family had moved from Richmond. His dad was an, uh, an attorney for the railroad. His mom ended up being a nurse in the hospitals in Washington, and he was buried there. I've got a, a copy of his obituary that was in the Washington paper. Um, so. That was the one thing, he was buried there. Uh, the flag is, is not a standard United States issued flag. And we know the 19th was issued a new color in the spring of 1863. How it, the late Howie Mattis, who was the, who's the authority on flags or was the authority on flags of the Civil War has this well documented in his book. It was a regulation flag, the material of this flag is cotton, okay? It doesn't have a sleeve on the fly. It's got eyelets. Dimensionally, it's wrong. It's not the flag. So what is it? Well, um, and besides the fact that if it had been wrapped in Ace's body, which they didn't get to the July 5th, I mean, I, okay, they say they cleaned it, but I mean, I'm telling you, I, I would have to think that it'd be, it, it would be stained. 
Um, it, 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 it can go a couple different directions. One, it might have been a company banner from Company B, uh, which was raised in Richmond, Indiana, which uh, Asa belonged to. Uh, I, we do know that they were given a flag when they marched off the war. Maybe it was that. Maybe they wrapped it in his body, you know, when he was buried or at the at his funeral was held in his, his dad's house, the viewing, which I guess the viewing. So maybe that was where the flag came from. Um, Burr Clifford, remember, Burr said he took the colors back to Cemetery Ridge. So how could it be the regimental flag if the colors went back to Cemetery Ridge? In 1913, Burr made a visit and took a look at, at the flags and he said he couldn't really identify the 19th flags. And there's a couple of them in the Indianapolis Museum. But, you know, he said, you know, it, it for heck is sure it's not that cotton flag or whatever that is that Asa was supposed to have been, you know, the regimental flag that he was supposed to have been buried in. The other um, interesting fact about Asa, and the blue flag is the regimental banner. It, it is, it is the regimental banner. And if I ever can do this presentation for you again in personal, personally, our unit has a great copy of both the national color and the regimental banner, the 19th that I bring. I, they're, they're really well done. A guy, and, so, and some of you people may, may know him, uh, Craig Satorius. Uh, is a longtime skirmisher. I think he's from Illyria and he, he made the flags for us. There's Ace's stone and, uh, and it's been replaced in the Congressional Cemetery. And there's a memorial stone in a cemetery in Vermont. Now, the other interesting thing about Asa is he had, he had a brother, Lucian, Lucian. And Lucian was in the Navy. And you can see by the stone that Lucian died July 25th, 1863. Without a date, without a doubt, July 1863 was a horrible month for the Blanchard family. Uh, he died at sea of yellow fever. That flag is pretty much dimensionally what a naval flag would be. And naval flags came in some different sizes, but they tended to be made of cotton because they would last longer. So is that a flag that came home with Lucian's effects since he was buried at sea? I guess we'll never know. But as we came back to, I'll come all the way back to the print. And here's the print. I know some of you may see it. I hope you all uh, have a copy of it. Um, I was very fortunate to work with Don Troyoni to bring this scene to life. Uh, it shows Asa pulling the shuck off the flag on East McPherson's Ridge. And to give you a sense of where that area is, Dudley had written, and this is well after the war, that he was told that Asa fell about 100 yards south of where Reynolds was wounded. So as we did the site work for this, you know, we just kind of took a hundred yards and it's a little bit to the west of the 151st Pennsylvania Mon Monument, we figure is where it would have been on the eastern edge of McPherson's Woods. Uh, working with Don Troni was fascinating. And I've had a lot of people say to me, um, how did you get Troni to do a print? Uh, well, I sent him an email late one night. I said, I've got this idea for a print. And I, I really didn't know him. I knew people who had worked with him. And he emailed me back in about a half hour, said, I like it, let's do it. And that's how it happened. So as we developed the details for the print, uh, it took a number of years to bring to life because he would stop uh, if he had a commission to do. But uh, we met for a day out on the battlefield uh, to do the site work. And he took a ton of pictures. And it was, um, it was really an interesting time. We could not find an image of Asa Blanchard uh, anywhere. We searched everywhere. The family line kind of died out after the Civil War. So um, 
this is my son, Matthew, who um, was waving the flag near the spot where we figured Asa went down. And Matthew has a kind of a sharp nose. So I kind of think maybe Don might have used him for, for Asa. But there's some other details that are interesting on the print and that we worked real hard on. And Lance Hurdigan was, uh, was a great help, Jerry Coates, uh, John Heiser. Uh, we worked uh, on one of the things you'll see if you look real close at that's all we need to do is knock that off. If you look real close at Ace in the middle, you'll notice he's wearing what looks like a foot officer sword. Dudley noted that it, during the law of the after the morning fight, he would he had uh, Lieutenant Colonel Newton George had uh, surrendered to Dudley, and Newton George uh, Asa gave. Um, our Dudley gave Asa uh, Newton George's sword as a badge of rank because the sergeant major, you really, that's the other thing, you often did not go into battle under arms. You went into battle with either an NCO sword or no sword at all because your job, again, was to not to fight, but to, to basically take care of, of the left flank uh, guy. So that is... Don, we, we told Don about this. It's well written. Don said, well, what kind of what kind of sword was it? And I said, I don't know what kind of sword it was. It was a sword. So you can see it's an NCO, not an NCO, but it's a foot officer scabbard. Uh, but we can't you can't see any more details than that. The other thing is that held up the print actually for a couple of weeks was did they have knapsacks or did they not have knapsacks? And um, we there's enough accounts of Iron Brigade soldiers who either lost their knapsacks in the fight of the afternoon of the first day or made a note of they've got a, a round through their knapsack that uh, we felt confident the 19th had knapsacks, combination of knapsack, knapsacks and blanket rolls. And I tell you what, it was a real detailed um, it was just a real interesting uh, process to bring this print to life. It really was. Uh, we tried to show a di some variants of different hardy hat styles. Uh, we knew that, you know, even though they were issued new hardy hats in the spring of 63, um, we knew that they would have been battered and worn a little bit by campaigning. So that's why you see some of the different styles in the black hats there. Um, The shuck was another. Don said, "I need to. I need a. You know, I need a picture of a shuck. I need a shuck." Well, so we looked. Ohio Historical Society had no original shucks, and Lance finally found one up in the Wisconsin Historical Society that we were able to photograph and get to Don, so he could have the correct look of what a shuck or flag cover was. This is where approximately with the American flag where I think that ASO uh, fell. I mean, obviously we don't know the exact spot, but you can see it's just to the south some of the, of the Reynolds Monument. As we wrap this up, one of the things I was privileged to do in July of 2013 was to, uh, with a color guard of uh, about six or seven guys along with the Liberty Rifles and who did the second Wisconsin did the last march of the Iron Brigade. And I don't know if any of you happened to be at Gettysburg then. Um, it was probably one of the biggest thrills of my life. Um, Scott Hardwick put the program on the National Park Service. We stepped off from the Kadori farm. Uh, it was hot. It was kind of rainy. The weather was almost identical to what the weather was on July 1st, 1863. Uh, we moved across the fields of seminary in front of, to the east of Seminary Ridge to the top of the ridge. And that's where we took our first water break. Um, then we looked back at the people because we really didn't have a feel for how many. And the line of people, 
extended from Seminary Ridge back to Emmonsburg Road, people that followed us. More than 2,000 people made that march with us. And when we got to the bottom of the swale, um, one of the sergeants said, pull the shuck, Abe. And that's when we let the, the regiment on the national color of the um, 19th Indiana fly pretty much the same spot that they flew on that fateful morning of July 1st, 1863. It was, um, man, it, I mean, I, it was it was a moment. It, it, it really was. I don't, the people that were there that were in the ranks, they'll all tell you that it was pretty special. And when we got to the top of, uh, when we got to the top of the ridge and we dismissed, a bunch of us went down to the 19th Monument to render honors. And kind of a little interesting quick side story. When we were doing the print, there's a guy by the name of Brett Wilson who lives on the West Coast. And Brett is a pretty advanced 19th Indiana collector. He had an ancestor that was wounded at Gettysburg. And so we're down at the monument and there's this family there and they're all excited about the colors and we're talking to them. And, you know, they're from the West Coast. And I, man, I was so hot and, you know, I wasn't even thinking straight. And it wasn't until the next day on the way home that I realized that I'd been talking to Brett Wilson, who I've been emailing with last couple of years on trying to get some of the facts of the fight of the color guard of the 19th on July 1st. So I sent him an email. I said, was that you? I sent him a picture of us standing together. And I said, was that you? And he emailed back. He said, yeah, was that you? So I said, I guess we met kind of. And there's our copy of the 19th Indiana flag that we have that the, the Union Guards Company A of the 19th has. If, if I ever get lucky enough to come to Cleveland, I'll be happy to bring up for you to see, along with some other things that are kind of hard to show on a Zoom presentation. And that kind of wraps it up right there. About the best I got. I'll be happy to try to take any questions if you have them. Okay, thanks a lot, Phil. Do we have some questions? Here's uh, some comments, great job. Uh, anybody have any questions? Well, I'll fill in the gap. Phil, Yeah. where Company K was in all this. Uh, hang on just a second. You know, I'm not the smartest guy in the book, but uh, in the world, but I got books. And it's funny. <laughs> there is a book. I will find it. If I can find I just had the picture. Because I was brushing up on this stuff today, which is what you do. Um, okay, Company K would have been the third company from the left on when they were in uh, on the east bank of McPherson's Ridge. I can tell you that. Okay, that's where Company K would have been. And I haven't found the flank markers for the 19th down there. But remember, their front was probably about 100 yards, if that, you know. It, you know, so yeah, that's where Company K would have been. Terrific. Uh, we got some other questions coming in. Um, did any soldier who refused a battlefield order to join the color guard or to hold the colors themselves face discipline or court martial afterwards? I've never seen. I have never. I have never heard of that. Um, you know, carrying the colors, picking the colors up, being on the color guard was such an honor. Uh, it, it, it really was. And that is why I really do think it is great, you know, William Roby Moore, and when I read that account, when he initially um, said he wouldn't do it, and they say he did, I really do think that's the guy that told him to go to hell. And, you know, he reconsidered. I mean, uh, and John uh, Priest and I have talked about this, Mike Priest and I have talked about it. And, you know, I, I can't wait. We're still, we're still putting together people and looking at records and, and trying to get a flow. And, and so I can't wait till he comes out with his final product on, on, on this because, you know, it's a worthy story to be told. No one will ever know, but I'd have to say that, I mean, I've never seen anybody that, that uh, faced discipline after the battle, you know? or after a battle to refusal to carry the colors. Okay, we got another question. What happened to the 19th after day one? Well, they went back to, um, 
they got they they fell back through town and and that's another program that i do uh i do a program the fight at the barricade which is the slight barricade of rails that abner doubleday caused to be raised uh actually robinson's division did it on the morning uh, late morning early afternoon of july 1st in front of the seminary ridge museum in fact we uh, the north south skirmish association donated the rails and we rebuilt the barricade and a couple of years ago we had an event there uh, it was put on by the seminary ridge museum which i'll give them a i'll give them a plug there it's a, it's a great museum uh, my wife amy and i donated a reproduction civil war ambulance to the museum which they have and um, we had a great event at the barricade of rails but that's another nice presentation because in my mind, and this is an ongoing argument that, that, that you, can, you can have, um, the 15 or 20 minutes that the old First Corps held back the advance of um, basically what had been Pender's Division, uh, you know, Scales Brigade, um, uh, probably, I like to say, saved the Federal Union. A lot of people will say that's dramatic. There's always the argument I got, okay, who fell back first, which was fought after the battle, the 11th Corps gave word, was the 1st Corps gave word, but I think the time bought there at Seminary Ridge, it's at, on Seminary Ridge, the Barricade Rails, gave enough time for a lot of the troops to clear through the streets of Gettysburg and uh, eventually form on, you know, East Cemetery Ridge. And uh, anyhow, back to the 19th. The 19th ended up the night of July 1st, in uh, in basically building some uh, slight uh, breastworks on Culp's Hill. And there's a little monument there that we helped dedicate 1995 or six of the 24th Michigan's position uh, on the evening July uh, 1st and then second and third. Uh, I was going to try to get a 19th Indiana monument marker put up. Uh, they were just to the right of the 24th, if I remember correctly. Unfortunately, I waited too long, and the, the moratorium went into effect on monuments, so the 19th doesn't have a marker there. Uh, actually, if you go through the woods and follow the trail along that trace of, uh, of earthworks, you will see there's, a, there's some markers for the Wisconsin regiments back in those woods uh, on, the, on the northeast face of uh, Culp's Hill. Yeah, I found the uh, the Wisconsin Regiment markers and the Michigan marker, and yep. I'm very upset that I couldn't find the 19th Indiana marker. So well, you look. Well, right you're looking. At, you're, you're, you can. You can. You're looking at the guy who didn't act fast enough to get it done. So <laughs> okay. I mean, I, you know what? You can throw a dart at me right now if you want to. We got another question for you. Um, is it known who and where the famous black hats were manufactured? Uh, I. Th no, I, I could probably dig that up for you. I think it was probably in in maybe in Philadelphia. Um, it'll take me some time, but I could, yeah, I could, okay. I, I could find out. We got another question. What happened to Lieutenant Colonel Dudley after the war? Oh, he he was involved. He actually, if I remember right, he was actually ended up being the head of the Bureau of Pensions. And I got to show you, I got up here, black hat, obviously. In company A. Now that. That, that's a fully dressed out black hat, but that's Company A, which is the Union Guard was Company A. Anyhow, uh, he also ran into some uh, vote, and this is kind of topical today, uh, some vote um, uh, counting issues in Indiana. I'm trying to think what president it was for. I can't really remember. I'll have to look it up. But yeah, he was well regarded, especially as head of the of the borough pensions. Yeah, but did, he had uh, like. We have a question from William Vaudray on: Did uh, the great Indiana governor Oliver Morton have any ties to the regiment? Yeah, they were called more that they're, they're called Morton's pets or Morton's babies. But <laughs> I tell you what, if you want a, a really interesting story, is uh, you know Morton and and uh, Meredith were really tight and. Uh, they had a real run-in, uh, and I'm now I can't remember the guy. There was another politician from Indiana. I'll think of his name as soon as the presentation's over. That um, 
was on the committee for the conduct of the war and he hated Saul Merida. Absolutely could not stand Saul Merida. Uh, and actually, it actually, after the war was well over, uh, Saul met up with him in, a, in the train station in Richmond. And if you read the newspaper accounts, gave him a whipping. Some of the accounts say that he put him over his knee like a baby and spanked him. So there's some real political intrigue. I got to remember that, the guy's name. I can't remember right now. Okay, we got another question. Why isn't there a walking bridge across Willoughby's Run? <laughs> well, it's probably more fun to jump on the rocks, but uh, <laughs> I think you'll see that because remember the Park Service acquired the land, the old golf course land, and they just haven't gone uh, to develop that, uh, you know. Uh, my uh, good friend, Andrew Dalton, who is the executive director of the Adams County Historical Society, um, wrote a, a book on the Harmon Farm when he was 16 years old. He's now 23 or 24 and heads up the society. He leads a, he, he can lead you on a nice tour of that side of the, of the uh, stream. Um, but I just, I think you eventually see that. Right, I, I saw somebody made a, uh, a note that you see what they're doing, starting to do with Culp's Hill now, uh, well, Gettysburg Foundation, you know, and I, I mean, I like that because if there's another confusing part of the battle, it's that Culp's Hill battle. And to be able to, to, uh, to take a look at the terrain, how it looked in 1863 would be great. Got another question for you about the Iron Brigade Battery, the... the Battery B of the 4th U.S. Artillery. Did they have 12-inch Napoleons or something else? Yep. They had 12-inch Napoleon, Model 1857, gun howitzers. They sure did. And they were really effective. Again, another good talk, which I would fold into a barricade talk, is how well the federal artillery was handled uh, by Wainwright, who was the um, First Corps Artillery Chief, on the uh, afternoon of the, of the first day. And especially in that fight to hold back the Confederate advance uh, on the afternoon of the first day against the barricade, you had um, Battery B had its six guns, which were north of the Chambersburg Road. Uh, the battery was split. Three of the guns were south of the railroad cut. Three were north of the railroad cut. And they really poured a devastating enfilade fire into the left flank of the Confederate advance. Um, Stevens Battery had Napoleons too. They were just uh, south of the Chambersburg Road in position. And then Coopers and Reynolds uh, had three inch uh, ordnance rifles, I believe, and they were, they were on Seminary Ridge too. But those batteries were really effective uh, that, that afternoon fight, especially the Napoleons, which are my favorite, which by far are my favorite artillery piece of the Civil War. Any other questions out there? I'm going to ask one more while we see if anybody else wants to ask one. Uh, when I was 12 years old, I went to Gettysburg for the first time, and we drove down, the, I guess, Meredith Boulevard, and there were all the nice Wisconsin monuments, and then there was that heroic 24th Michigan monument, and then I looked around and looked around, and down in the hollow is that little itty-bitty 19th Indiana thing. How did it get there, and why does it look so puny? Well, you know, number one, the terrain has been changed a lot. And that's why the road is up. E even though they were down in a hole, there's no doubt about it. Number two, the state of Indiana. I mean, you know, it all goes back to the, what the state would allocate for monuments. Uh, the 27th Indiana's, no, the 7th Indiana monument up on Culp's Hill is horrible. And um, I, yeah, I, I, I know. I know. I mean, I've taken, as you guys can see, a ton of pictures of the of the Iron Brigade monuments, and um, yeah, it is down a hole. It tends to get. I mean, you just drive by it, and unless you are like me and don't drive by it, um, yeah, it's all the state of Indiana. I don't. I don't know. I mean, the the Wisconsin monuments are beautiful. I mean, just gorgeous, as you know, and so is Twenty Fourth Michigan's monument. Um, I saw coming up, I got a comment. I'm going to have, you know, because uh, my good friend, uh, Mike Eisenhut is on. And um, I was going to give you a plug for your book, Mike. I just hadn't gotten there yet. 
Mike has written, um, Mike worked hard. I mean, really hard. Um, and has written a, a, a book, a novel that is coming out on um, this, I hope in this couple months on the 19th Indiana, in particularly at Gettysburg. Um, I worked with Mike on the novel uh, for a long time. It's called, it's called Brothers of War, the Iron Brigade at Gettysburg. Um, I'm sure that Mike would like would like to have fired me any number of times when I was ripping apart his his book, but I tell you what, he learned a lot, and it, it's it's a pretty it's it's going to be a pretty good pretty good Civil War novel. I mean it, it I mean it really is. I mean he he worked hard on it. He worked through some illness, and uh, he's a furloughed airline pilot and from Indiana from the Indianapolis area, and um, so you can look Appreciate for that. that so. Yeah, I appreciate that, Phil. So, Mike, does that answer your question? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I had to get that in there. So, yeah, thank you, Michelle. Mike, I'll send you. I'll send you my Venmo stuff after this meeting is over. Okay. Okay. (laughs) There, there is a website, and it's got like the last March the Iron Brigade video on there, and some things for the 19th Indiana guys. It's called BrothersOfWarBook.com. I'm not trying to plug my own book here, but I did. (laughs) Yes, you are. Thanks for the shout out. Okay. Well, I mean, so much of what I've done, you know, with the 19th and with my other Civil War stuff, too. I mean, I've got some some other presentations. One that I really like to do is Arming Ohio, the Guns of the First Volunteers, which I hope to be able to bring to you guys sometime with my collection. You can't hardly do it online, but, but when I bring the firearms and lay them out, we talk about them, let everybody pick them up. I mean, I'm, you know, it, it's it's a good presentation. But I would not, I mean, I, I mean, I've got to thank I just a bunch of, you know, people that have really inspired me. I mean, Lance Hurtigan to begin with. I mean, I've known him for a long time. And you guys know he's the, I call him the boss black hat when it comes to the Iron Brigade. Um, I shot with him in the NSSA for a long time. A fine rifle musket shot, a fine author, um, and one of the best. I mean, we would talk on the phone. We'd still do. And at the end of going through stuff, he would always say, we have more fun than most people, don't we? And you know what? We do. Um, just, uh, you know, if you want a, a good tour of the fight of the first day, get a hold of licensed battlefield guide, Eric Limblade. He and Jim Hessler do the Gettysburg podcast, I, which is a great podcast. But Eric is riding the regimental now on the 26th North Carolina, a real deep dive. I mean, he is, he took the guide test, uh, I think the same time I did. He did good, I didn't. Um, so, you know, get a hold of Eric. And well, Eric, uh, Eric is a member of our group. Good. Well, yeah, yeah, that's right. He's an Indians guy. He's a great guy. Uh, right. He, yeah. he uh, was co winner of our debate last month on yeah, yeah, he, yeah, influential movie. Uh, one last quick question for you. Yep. Uh, some of the folks want to know if the National Park Visitor Center and facilities are open or not. Wasn't open a couple of weeks ago. Okay. I mean, well, I want no, to thank. Go ahead. Nah, no, no, no bathrooms on the battlefield open either. So, you okay. know, I'm telling well, you. Bill, thanks so much for spending the evening with us. We're glad you were able to do this by Zoom. Uh, it would have been nice to have you in person and to see all the things you have, but uh, we certainly appreciate it. I want to thank you again, and, and maybe uh, we can get you up here sometime when uh, uh, when that's possible. But thank you. Well, when, when, when I can make the trip, uh, like I said, it's a short two hours and 45 minutes. So when I when we can do it, I, I sure as heck want to come up and we'll do another presentation or whatever you guys you guys like to have. Okay. I appreciate it. And we're yep. going to sign off, everybody. Thank you all for being here. And remember, next month, uh, our meeting is on African American women in the District of Columbia. Uh, Col- yeah, District of Columbia with Professor Tamika Nunley. So thank you, Phil. Thank you all. See you guys. And stay safe till then. Huzzah! Everybody. Huzzah! <laughs>